Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Murray Fulton. I am the director of the Center for the Study of Cooperatives. I'm your MC this afternoon. Um, it is my distinct pleasure to um, uh, welcome all of you to the third annual McPherson Talks. Um, the McPherson Talks, this is a lecture series that was um, started by the Center for the Study of Co-ops um, a number of years ago to specifically commemorate um, Ian McPherson and the work that Ian did. Um, Ian, for those of you who don't know, and we have many international guests here that are attending um, the governance school that's going on this same week. Um, Ian was a cooperative scholar of um, very high note. He was a historian and wrote extensively about the history of the cooperative movement in Canada. Um, but Ian did much more than that. He was also, um, the, the simplest way would be he was a practitioner at the local level where he served on um, local um, credit union board. Um, he served at the national level um, on um, what was at the time known as the Canadian Cooperative Association and other um, national cooperative bodies. And he also played a very important role internationally um, taking on the job of writing the ICA principles or rewriting the ICA principles, uh, what, Brett, 1995? Um, so Ian was um, the, the person that was responsible in large part for going around the world and talking to people and saying what needs to be in the ICA principles. Um, Ian was um, also just a, a wonderful man to be around, um, lots of fun. Um, and uh, particularly if, if you invited him to go for a beer, um, he um, would love to tell um, stories about the things that he did, the people that he'd met um, around the world. So um, that, um, this lecture is um, um, devoted to um, honoring and remembering Ian McPherson. Um, I, uh, I'm delighted this afternoon to um, introduce Dion Poehler, um, who is going to give um, this year's the McPherson Talks. Um, Dion is an assistant professor at the Center for Industrial Relations and Human Resources at the University of Toronto. Um, until a year ago, she was here at the University of Saskatchewan with us at the Center for the Study of Co-ops and the Johnson Shoyama Graduate School. And it is a delight to have you back, Dion. Um, so, um, without further ado, I'm, I'm going to invite Dion up. At the end of this, there will be time for questions, and I have, there's a, other, there's a few announcements um, that I want to um, also make, but let's get on to the main event right away. So, Dion. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It's nice to see so many faces in the audience, so many familiar faces. Welcome to those who are joining us uh, via the live video conference uh, from elsewhere in the country and around the world. Um, as Marie said, I've been at the University of Toronto for just over a year, uh, and it's been wonderful, uh, but this is home, and uh, so it's wonderful to be back. Um, I grew up on a farm uh, about two hours northeast of, of Saskatoon, um, and I was the oldest of nine children, and I often say that if my parents had had enough farmland to give to all of us, that I wouldn't be standing in front of you here today. So I suppose in some ways um, I should be uh, grateful for that. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis, and uh, that I'm grateful to our ancestors uh, of this place, First Nations and Métis people, and, and, and their ancestors, and reaffirm our relationship with one another. I'd also like to acknowledge Ian McPherson, uh, who this talk is named after, um, and who I never had the pleasure of meeting, uh, but who I know from reading some of his work, as well as from people, uh, hearing stories from people who knew him well, um, that he is uh, or, and was uh, the kind of academic that I'm aspiring to be, somebody who really tried to be engaged in the sector, engaged in the community, and do research that is really uh, useful and practically relevant um, for those who are facing challenges inside their own organizations. 
I'd also like to acknowledge, um, and I can't list all of the people, I have a list up here, but it doesn't even cover it, um, of, of individuals, organizations, um, associations that have given time in terms of interviews, um, money, general support, um, and have really in many ways taught me um, a number of things about uh, the sector and about governance. Um, and so many of the insights and, and ideas that come that I'm going to be sharing with you today uh, are the, uh, the product of cooperative effort. Um, and many of the insights belong uh, to the broader cooperative movement. Um, I also want to frame my presentation today by saying that uh, I'm not, when I talk about governance today, I'm not going to be focused on the governance challenges at, in lo at local credit union boards. Um, I do have a report coming out really soon. It's in the copy editing process on governance challenges in Canadian credit unions at the local board level um, that I did for Canadian Credit Union Association and Filing Research Institute out of the United States. Um, and uh, there's insights and recommendations in there. Um, many of the uh, things I'm going to be ta talking to you about today also have uh, implications for local credit union boards. Um, but today what I'm really going to be focused on um, are the uh, uh, governance challenges facing credit unions as a system, the credit union system as a whole, in particular the governance challenges that arise in coordination and cooperation between credit unions uh, between credit union organizations. Um, and so that's the focus of my talk today. Um, but if you're interested, there's going to be um, a, another report coming out um, that is more focused on governance challenges at uh, the local credit union level. Oops. Okay. So uh, just to start uh, and give a bit of a framing, uh, many of you are from uh, elsewhere um, around the world uh, who are here for the Co-op Governance School and, and those who may be uh, joining by video stream. Um, the credit union landscape is, uh, is, is characterized by a, a rapidly changing environment. Um, there's intensified pressures on the current model. And uh, in October 2016, Central One, one of the, s the credit union uh, system level associations or uh, organizations, um, published a report, uh, and I think they have a quote that summarizes the challenges nicely. Credit unions are being consistently outpaced by the scale and marketing strength of major banks. The credit union system is struggling to keep up with the digital offerings of banks and of new financial technology entrants. Many of our systems are outdated and lack coherence. We have an aging membership base and we lag behind the banks in selling secondary services to our members. We lack the capacity for data analytics that would help us understand and more effectively meet our customers' needs. We face a complex and ever-changing regulatory environment. The second tier network has also fallen behind the times, and the structure of provincial or regional centrals is a relic of the pre-digital era and is too expensive to maintain over the long term. While there will be always be provincial government issues and local economic conditions to address, most of the needs of credit unions are substantially similar across the country. A fragmented system is structurally incapable of providing or implementing the technological innovations that credit unions need to, to compete effectively with banks and does not have the transaction volume to make its services affordable to credit unions. So that, I think, structures um, a little bit the pressures um, and, and puts into uh, context the pressures that are facing many, many credit unions uh, ar around the country. Um, and there's a recognition, not uh, just by academics, but by those within the system itself, that there's a need to do things differently to maintain credit union relevance and the sustainability of the system. Um, the status quo of many local credit unions existing at the level of local communities, uh, small local credit unions, um, potentially uh, engaging in um, partnerships at, at the provincial level in terms of payment systems um, and other types of services um, is not sustainable in this current uh, changing environment. Um, many credit unions have started to address some of these challenges through uh, a, um, a wave of mergers and consolidations at the local level um, and some strategic partnerships and, and reorganizations at the system level. Um, and that even uh, they're starting to recognize within the system that this may not be enough to achieve the required efficiency gains to be able to compete effectively with banks. 
Um, and so there is a recognition among some that system level transformative change is required. Um, and many of the discussions that are occurring right now in the system and uh, among academics who are studying these kinds of things um, is how the credit union system uh, should reorganize at the system level. Um, and so many of the discussions and debates that are being had right now are about uh, this issue. Um, the way that uh, uh, a number of us who have been looking at issues that face governance challenges that face um, cooperatives that are seeking to collaborate with each other are really twofold. One is the efficiency autonomy trade-off, and the other one is uh, the need for a new governance framework. And I'm going to talk about both of these in a little more depth. Um, but underlying both of these issues uh, is it's important to remember that there are differing views among credit unions and their leaders am about the best path forward. Um, and so it's not clear even that, that um, all of uh, the players see the problems the same way, but they definitely do not agree necessarily on the solutions and the best path forward. Um, and so one of the things that we're offering today is one way of, of, of thinking about how we could uh, think through some of the solutions. Um, on the efficiency autonomy trade-off as one of the key challenges, um, the issue with, um, uh, with, uh, within any system that's attempting or, uh, or collaborative effort, um, integration and consolidation can achieve efficiencies, um, but it's well known that many of those things come at the expense of local autonomy and control. Um, when you think about the chartered banks, another type of system that exists within um, the financial services industry, um, the chartered banks operate at a very high level of efficiency. Um, but when you think about local bank branches, there's, they have very little autonomy over um, their activities, over their branding, over the, the ways that they offer services. Um, and if you think about credit unions, credit unions for the most part have a high degree of local autonomy. Um, and, and, and in many cases exercise that. They may be forced to collaborate um, due to regulatory requirements or um, may choose to collaborate and give up some of their local autonomy because of uh, scale issues. Um, but for the most part, credit unions are still operating it with a very high level of local autonomy. And if you think about comparing that to other systems like Desjardins in the financial services sector, um, Desjardins, the locals have a lot less autonomy um, and have a higher degree of efficiency, a much higher level of efficiency. Um, and that's a, a, a system of credit unions in, the, in, in um, Quebec that comes out of Quebec, for those of you who are not familiar with Desjardins. Um, and outside of the financial services industry, there are examples of federations of local, coop local retail cooperatives um, in the cooperative retailing system in Western Canada, for instance, where retail, local retail co-ops choose to give up a, a, a high degree of autonomy in order to achieve efficiency. Um, and interestingly enough, um, in many ways, have figured out a way to actually provide more autonomy to the locals than even um, the Desjardins system. And we can talk a little bit more about the details um, in each of these systems um, uh, later if people are interested. Um, one of the interesting things about the efficiency autonomy trade-off is that this isn't unique to the credit union sector. So I, for anyone who is raised um, in rural um, Western Canada or even other parts of rural Canada or even in other um, maybe potentially other countries, um, this was a, a very big issue um, a number of, uh, a few decades ago when there was a rash of, of school closures and hospital closures in small towns. Um, and I remember living through this because my parents would debate and be very involved in the local politics of small school closures and hospital closures. And there was a fierce um, uh, uh, localism and, and desire to keep K-12 uh, school, a kindergarten to grade 12 school in every community, seven kilometers apart from each other, an acute care facility, um, a hospital in every, uh, sm uh, every small community that had one. And there was a lot of opposition to closing um, these uh, schools and hospitals, even though um, there was a high degree of inefficiency, in some cases quality suffered. Um, I was triple graded for most of my elementary school education, so the worst part about it was I had to be in school with two of my siblings at the same time. Um, but the credit union sector has a completely different set of dynamics because it operates in a for-profit, highly competitive industry. Um, but there are similar connections to be drawn to debates that were being had around credit union mergers and consolidations. Some of these same issues around efficiency and autonomy trade-offs um, uh, arose there as well. Um, and similar conversations were had. 
Um, the interesting thing is that um, in the school and hospital closure settings, in many cases, because people held out for so long because of fear of losing services and, and control in local communities, the system as a whole actually suffered. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why credit unions might be hesitant or unwilling to give up autonomy to achieve uh, these efficiency gains. One is that um, credit unions may not actually believe, or some credit unions may not actually believe that the system is truly at a crossroads and, in, and really in need of major transformative change to facilitate its ongoing sustainability. Another reason uh, could be that the gain in efficiency is more highly valued, or it isn't as highly valued as the loss in autonomy um, is. And a third reason could be that actually because we're operating in such a volatile and uncertain environment, um, where technology is changing rapidly, we have changing regulations, we have changing demographics, uh, urbanization, a lot of external pressures, that it's not clear that the way that we've calculated or uh, are projecting the benefits and costs, that these have been properly measured or that they're likely to even materialize. And so these are three reasons why credit unions might be hesitant or unwilling to give up autonomy to achieve some of these efficiency gains. Um, and again, we observe these in conversations around closure of credit union branches, mergers and consolidations. And I also, with my, my mother who is very <laughs> involved in some of those conversations as well, um, have heard a lot of the similar kinds, uh, these similar kinds of, of, of issues being raised. So um, some may believe in the credit union system as well that efficiency gains can be achieved without losing any autonomy. And I would argue uh, that uh, if, if th and that would be uh, sort of consistent with following a path C where actually we could achieve some efficiencies without giving up local control or autonomy. And I would argue uh, that if path C was possible, gaining efficiency without any loss of autonomy, it would have happened by now. And I think to the extent that it is possible, it has happened, um, and that it's not likely to uh, uh, occur in any more um, a serious way. So path B is uh, uh, where uh, credit unions are required to give up some autonomy to achieve efficiency gains is, is much more likely to be realistic. Um, but uh, it, this is a risky strategy um, because credit unions could be reluctant to first give up power and control for all of the reasons that I said. Um, and they also need to believe that others will honor their commitments to the system if they actually give up that control. So. What path B requires is a leap of faith on the part of credit unions. Um, and to achieve the, the trust that's required for credit unions to take this leap of faith actually first requires the development of a completely new governance framework for cooperation among credit unions. Um, and so what do we mean by governance? Um, well, that's the second key challenge. Um, and uh, many of, uh, I, I've been working on these ideas in uh, a variety of different ways with my colleagues here at the public policy school um, and at the Center for the Study of Cooperatives. Um, and we adopt a much broader definition and perspective on governance um, than uh, maybe many people think of when they think about corporate governance or cooperative governance. Um, our, our understanding of governance is that governance is really the set of formal and informal arrangements by which power is allocated and exercised in any interdependent system. So to put it more bluntly, um, power is the formal and informal rules that determine who gets to decide what. Um, and this is important, and, and uh, the formal rules are important, and this is often what we focus on in terms of the organizational structure and legal frameworks and voting rules and, and board selection mechanisms, but the informal norms around culture and um, how we engage in member, stake, member consultation practices and the broader sort of local context, all of these things determine who has power, authority, and influence, um, and so who gets to decide what. Um, and we also believe that um, when we think about governance this way, over the long run, we can evaluate the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of different governance arrangements by how they resolve three key governance challenges. And these are the three governance challenges um, that we think are, are are the most critical. Um, the first one is, is sort of your classic managing of, of interdependencies uh, between um, stakeholders in the system. So how do you get stakeholders to coordinate their activities when they share the same goals? How do you uh, 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 disincentivize opportunistic behaviors when some stakeholders share, the, uh, share goals and others don't? Um, how do you address problems like free riding uh, between credit unions? Um, legitimacy, the second uh, governance challenge, 
requires securing the cooperation of all players inside the system. Um, it, and internal legitimacy is really important among the credit unions themselves to ensure that they actually will follow the rules that are set um, by the governance uh, framework. Um, but it also includes a broader s idea of legitimacy around um, whether or not regulators see it as, as, as legitimate, whether or not the broader public sees credit unions as offering value beyond what uh, they could achieve or receive from investor-owned banks. Um, and the third one is whether or not uh, the system or organization can adapt and respond to changing and uncertain environments. When we talk about governance, we often focus on risk and we spend a lot of time talking about risk, but risk is a fundamentally different thing than uncertainty. Uh, risk is really easy to calculate and assign probability to, to the likelihood that different events will occur. Um, but uncertainty is when environments and technology are changing so quickly uh, that there's no way of knowing what possibilities are more or less likely to occur. Um, and to be more specific, um, about the practical challenges associated with each of these. I gave a few examples already, but how do you incentivize coordination and address the different forms of opportunistic behavior that can arise? How do you develop trust and fairness in applying the rules about what's expected by stakeholders in the system um, and how you'll distribute benefits? Um, and how do you actually design goals and strategies for a system when the different stakeholders hold very different views of what's likely to occur in the future? Um, and so these are the really uh, practical challenges um, that uh, we're, uh, I'm going to try and pr present a few uh, um, principles around which we can actually start to think about how we might start to resolve some of these issues. Um, but first, I think it's necessary to think about um, the broader, uh, a little bit of, of what's underlying um, some of these issues at the, in, in cooperation among credit unions. Um, a key challenge really is fundamentally the free rider problem. Um, so Eleanor Ostrom, uh, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2009, um, she actually has carried out some of the most significant research on the conditions under which people will cooperate, um, particularly in the presence of common pool resources. Um, and common pool resources are um, situations, common pool, or sometimes they referred to as common property resources. These are resources that are part of natural or human-made systems, um, and they have unique characteristics um, that make it really difficult to exclude others that didn't invest in the initial production of or safeguarding of those resources, um, but they still can benefit from the creation of those resources. Um, and that in these situations, often what occurs is that individual users or individual organizations, or in this case, credit unions, um, if they act in a, in, in, in a way that is to maximize their own organizational objectives, this can be contrary to the, the common good that's created and can actually lead to a depletion or spoiling of resources through their collective activities. And there's lots of examples of credit union common pool resources. So a couple would be, one is the brand. Um, so it's possible that um, credit unions, uh, some credit unions will act in a way that is not, ma you know, uh, is not focused on members. Um, and uh, can, can capitalize upon the brand that uh, and public trust that's been created by uh, the broader credit union system. Deposit insurance that's been built up over decades um, allows some credit unions to potentially take on riskier activities because, um, uh, because of the presence of that uh, deposit insurance. Uh, Underinvestment in centrals, um, uh, central credit union uh, organizations or trade associations where the spillover benefits of the lobbying activities that are undertaken um, benefit the, uh, all the credit unions, but some, some credit unions uh, pay more or invest more in uh, these associations and, and centrals. Um, and also actually another interesting one, it's relevant because I'm, I'm an academic and we're at the center of the study of cooperatives, but research and education on cooperatives um, has a public uh, benefit uh, that some uh, invest in more than others. Um, and so there's lots of examples of credit union common pool resources. Um, and uh, Eleanor Ostrom has done a lot of work um, in thinking through um, how some systems avoid falling prey to the tragedy of the commons. Um, and we actually uh, took some of her principles and some of her ideas and we tried to adapt them in a couple of different settings um, to understand first and foremost, uh, we applied them to understand cooperative Federation successes and failures in the retail sector, um, the case of Co-op Atlantic and the case of Federated Cooperatives Limited. Um, and we've now applied them in a, in a new report um, that you're um, all, it's available for free at the Center for the Study of Cooperatives website. I encourage you all 
uh, to go and, and read it. It's very accessible. Um, where we've adapted many of the design principles that Ostrom considered in the governance of natural resource systems um, to apply them to the, credit, the, challenges, the governance challenges that credit unions are facing. The thing I want to point out before I actually go through these design principles, and there are six of them, is that you can't consider these design principles simply as a checklist. And you know, if you do half of them, you're, you're going to be fine. Um, you have to think about the design principles as a blueprint for action. Um, and that this requires a fundamental shift in mindset among credit unions. Um, this is a fundamentally different way of thinking about coordinating and cooperating uh, be and structuring the activities and discussions between credit unions. Um, these have to be thought about as a blueprint and a shift in mindset um, to help credit unions develop trust, to help them make credible commitments to each other. The specific details about what rules will govern the ongoing collaborations and how the organizations or collaborations will be structured have to come out of a, a commitment to these design principles as the way to facilitate these discussions. Um, the other thing I want to say about these, uh, these uh, design principles is that they should be designed uh, and, and thought about with the credit unions in mind as the key stakeholders. So this, even though many of the uh, second and third tier organizations have been a part of the discussions, and rightfully so, um, this is not about the centrals or the trade associations. This is about um, the credit unions themselves. Um, and, it, and it isn't fundamentally about whether or not credit unions trust or don't trust the centrals or the third tier associations. And it's not necessarily about how you could restructure those organizations either. This is about facilitating a process uh, for how to build trust among the credit unions themselves. So the first design principle um, that I want to talk about is um, how to, is that it's important for uh, credit unions to establish clear boundary rules for membership. So membership has to be voluntary, um, but the other side of it uh, is that you're either in or you're out. Um, it's credit unions that don't invest in this uh, undertaking and don't invest in the creation of these common pool resources um, or these benefits and these uh, central activities and organizations should not benefit from uh, the creation of of these organizations. And the reason this is important is because this addresses free rider problems by building identity between credit unions, um, which fosters subsequent trust as well. And it also makes members' rights and responsibilities much more transparent. Um, and so then uh, members can hold each other much more accountable. Um, the second design principle is that uh, credit unions uh, need to discuss how to allocate benefits and decision-making rights in proportion to how each member is contributing to the central organization or central undertaking success. Um, and it's really important to define what contribution will mean in that context. Um, and that this definition, however contribution is defined, will be used to allocate um, the decision-making rights and the distribution of benefits. Um, and two things that are important to remember here is that contributions for each dimension, decision-making rights and the distribution of benefits, don't have to be exactly the same thing. Um, it's also important to uh, realize that in second-tier uh, cooperative undertakings, where you have cooperation among cooperatives, um, the ICA principles actually or the, uh, state this, uh, that there's no need for one member, one vote in second tier cooperative associations. Um, and in many cases, that actually can contribute, especially when there's very large size differences between uh, the cooperatives that are cooperating. That can actually result in uh, problematic outcomes. But at the same time, um, we can't allow the e equality principle or the quality value around cooperation among cooperatives and, and cooperative forms in general to get too far outside agreed upon bounds. Um, and that trying to balance this idea of equity in terms of, in terms of larger credit unions um, or larger credit unions with larger membership bases or ones that use the services of the central more so um, with, uh, with giving a voice to um, uh, credit unions that are very much dependent on the system, very much use it and rely on it, um, but may not uh, have uh, transact as much volume um, with uh, or uh, engage uh, in, in this quite the same way. So it's about striking a balance between equity and, and equality. Um, and that helps to build trust and legitimacy. And so every group has to give uh, some something in this. Um, 
and in some ways, uh, contribution can be defined very uh, in a way that actually makes sense to the system. So people often ask, well, so what happens if smaller credit unions can't or don't have as much uh, to transact, or they don't invest as much in terms of dollars. Oftentimes, what smaller credit unions bring is the external legitimacy. Um, and so uh, you don't under necessarily start with the perspective that just the money is, is the only way to contribute, but it is a really critical and important piece of it. Um, and so don't also underestimate the, the value that, that the organizations, the credit unions that are transacting a lot of business with the central or uh, working through the central um, bring as well. The third design principle is um, that uh, credit unions uh, need to figure out a way to ensure rapid access to low cost arenas to resolve conflict. So in many cases what happens is in a central organization, um, the central officials need to be given some power to find compromises and mediate and arbitrate disputes between organizations. I mean this is important to be able to resolve conflicts and issues in a fairly rapid manner. Um, but this can raise issues around what kinds of rules um, or decision criteria are being used to resolve the conflicts. And that can raise issues then for groups of credit unions that feel like the central is not resolving the conflicts in their interest. Um, so this can solve free rider problems between credit unions and incentivize coordination. Um, but this can then lead to a second level problem where there's opportunism of the central. So the central then you know, it starts to do things that different groups of credit unions don't feel are as useful for their particular group or organization. Um, so there's two design principles that are really necessary to think about to actually counteract that potential. Um, and the first one is that members really need to be uh, active in participating in making and modifying the rules that the central will, will, uh, will uh, apply. So members have to have some say in the development of the rules. Um, and uh, in this case, when they have uh, some involvement, the rules are more likely to be seen as legitimate. And, and thus, the, the credit unions will be more likely to follow those rules if they had a, say, uh, a hand in creating those rules. Um, and related to this, it's, it's sort of a, 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 a go, co in, it goes hand in hand with the fourth design principle. Member organizations also need the ability to select their own monitors. Um, and this can be done in a variety of ways, but they need to actually help establish the rules about how their, their monitors, or they'll have people monitoring um, uh, what activities the central is undertaking. Um, but it's important to remember that members can also monitor the central a central's activities as customers. Um, and so uh, that is an important monitoring mechanism that oftentimes people feel uh, uh, is not as important as, as uh, representation on the board, for instance, of a central organization. But it's absolutely critical, especially when there's voluntary membership and services can be received from other types of organizations um, within the system. Um, the fifth design principle is that member organizations select their own monitors. Um, so members have to be able to participate in making the rules about how monitors will be selected. Um, and they, uh, um, sorry, not everybody has to be a monitor, but the monitors have to be trusted and ensure that the rules and norms are followed. Um, this, this really helps address uh, both the coordination problems and the opportunism problems that can arise the, the, uh, within the central. So both design principle four, members participating in making and modifying in the rules, and design principle five, where member organizations select their own monitors, helps address that second order problem of opportunism by the central. And finally, the, the sixth design principle is that organizing um, uh, in this way requires that um, credit unions think about structuring governance activities in multiple layers. So these kinds of principles should actually be established and followed at various levels of governance and in all the activities that are being undertaken. Um, it's really difficult to, um, to apply them in one setting and not in the other because it actually creates a set of norms around how uh, credit unions will interact with each other. Um, one of the reasons that this is also uh, important is because a diversity of perspectives um, are in conditions of rapid change and, and high uncertainty, volatile environments. Um, when you have a diversity of perspectives, um, that can actually lead to better decision making under uncertainty. And there's actually a really great study that just came out in the Academy of Management Journal on uh, the fact that actually diversity of perspectives um, in uncertain environments is more important than expertise 
on boards of community banks in the United States. Um, and that expertise can actually be a detriment in conditions of rapidly changing uh, environments. Um, the other thing as well is, uh, some of you may be more or less familiar with Central One's discussion paper, um, but they gave a number of options. Um, and our view um, in our, that we come to in our report is that the consolidate and integrate option um, is much more viable. So in, instead of having separate functional areas that all have separate governance systems within the credit union system, um, that because of the uh, way that governance would work um, and would need to be thought about in terms of building trust, um, consolidating and, and integrating um, all of the different functional areas that credit unions need as back support um, and bringing that under the same type of governance framework or the same approach to governance is likely to be the most efficient. Um, and because of the uh, necessary upfront cost in developing a new form of governance and a new way of governing and in coordination and cooperation between the credit unions, that this is um, uh, going to re require a huge upfront cost and building legitimacy and trust. Um, and so that is likely to be uh, the most uh, successful. Um, Here's a, just a bit of a summary in terms of the way that we think about governance, the way we think about the design principles, and the way we think about the objectives of the credit unions at the system level. So um, the credit union objectives at the system level are centralized economic coordination of some activities to achieve efficiency gains, um, to be able to compete effectively with the banks, um, to be able to address um, some of the fixed capital costs through regulations and uh, um, technology, uh, uh, investments, um, but also to preserve some level of local autonomy and control, um, and that there are tensions between these two credit union objectives. Um, and we argue that um, similar to other types of, of, of systems where common pool resources exist, that if you adopt a set of design principles in uh, in what we call business federations um, or cooperative federations, that this can help uh, build the trust and legitimacy in the process among the internal stakeholders uh, to uh, be able to develop the actual formal rules around how decisions are made and who gets to decide what. Um, and, and that ultimately the whole purpose is to uh, uh, address the key governance challenges that are facing um, the credit union system. Um, and that that is one of the major ways um, that uh, credit unions are going to be able to compete uh, effectively and survive. So a few implications of this different kind of framework and approach. These design principles uh, have, do have important overlap with the co-op principles. Many of you will recognize some of them uh, as uh, very similar to some of the co-op principles. They're not exactly overlapping, but in some ways the co-op principles um, have uh, have thought it, it, the development of the co-op principles had considered many of these challenges around opportunism, coordination, free rider problems, um, building legitimacy among the stakeholders. Um, but neither the, the design principles that we um, uh, uh, propose uh, that are adapted from Ostrom nor the co-op principles are the same as co-op values. And so if you think about it as um, maybe this is a better way of thinking about it, the design principles are guidelines for how to put the values into action. Um, so if credit unions don't agree on the values of self-help, self-responsibility, democracy, e equality, equity, solidarity, um, it's going to be very difficult to agree to this set of design principles as a way to uh, move forward. Um, elected officials uh, likely will need to play a much larger role. Um, to date, a lot of the conversations have been driven by um, um, by uh, management and senior executives in credit unions, which, is, uh, which has been very good uh, because they've identified many of the challenges with uh, efficiency and competition. Um, and many of them, in fact, all of the ones that I've talked to are very, very dedicated to the cooperative business model um, and want to see it sustain itself and survive. Um, but uh, oftentimes, uh, for because they're focused so much on the efficiency um, aspect, um, some of the governance issues uh, get uh, left behind. Um, and oftentimes, the elected officials will be perceived, rightfully or right, rightly or wrongly, um, will be perceived as being uh, slightly more legitimate in terms of being able to set these uh, kinds of principles because they are elected by the members. Um, 
And at the very minimum, governments and regulators must be supportive of credit union collaboration. You can't have governments restricting um, collaboration between credit unions, for instance. And we're lucky right now, for the most part in Canada, that that's not been too much of an issue. But it actually, it, it could become an issue um, if, if we aren't uh, cognizant of the fact that um, that also credit unions are starting to compete with each other as well, and that that raises a whole host of other issues around building trust within the system and, and how that looks. So in conclusion, um, I would say that one of the reasons that I've been so passionate about this, I've been interested in um, how cooperatives that are operating in increasingly competitive industries survive and thrive. Um, and I've been so passionate about this because I, I really believe uh, from both the empirical research that I've done, empirical research I've read, that credit unions are necessary um, to solve market frictions, solve certain market and policy failures, but also to make the system more fair um, and lead to a different distribution of wealth in society. And so I think that credit union failure would be a disaster, not just for their members, but for the stability and the fairness of Canada's entire economic system. And so that's one, it's not just because I'm a member of a credit union, it's also because I see the benefits to the economy of having a strong, uh, stable, and resilient credit union system. Um, cooperatives are much less likely to fail, especially once they become established uh, than investor-owned firms, but they're not immune. And uh, my colleagues and I have studied credit er, cooperative failures. Um, and, uh, and so they're not immune uh, from the governance challenges uh, that exist in other organizations. Um, and on that, the governance challenges facing credit unions are not unique. They exist in the public sector, they exist in investor-owned firms. Um, maybe some of, the s some of the focus on certain types of governance challenges may be slightly different, but absolutely the solutions that need to be applied um, in the cooperative model and in the cooperative system um, might have to be different than the kinds of solutions we apply in other types of organizations and systems. Um, and so uh, I think uh, with that, um, I've probably covered a lot. I, I often uh, struggle with trying not to put an entire university course into one <laughs> lecture, but, uh, and I don't do very well with that all the time. If you want more um, detail about any of this or any more examples specific to uh, the credit union system and other systems, please uh, download the report. Like I said, it's very accessible and easy to read. And on that, I'll uh, open up the floor to questions. Thank you. Oh, somebody's coming up here. Hello there. Um, my name is Mitchell Anderson. I'm a director with Affinity Credit Union yes. as well as with Credit Union Central Saskatchewan. But I'm speaking on just as myself. Um, I'm interested in principle five around uh, members of, of these collective undertakings selecting their own monitors. And I feel as though there's a tension between that principle and the, the conclusion that the consolidate and integrate option for credit union back um, second tier functions um, that there's a tension to me because the challenge that we might find for a variety of cultural reasons is that um, the more direct the monitoring is, the more likely it is to be effective, and the more indirect the monitoring is, the more likely it is that these collective undertakings will, um, the classic principal agent problem, pursue their own interests rather than the interests of the m members they're serving, and which is why um, my view of what the future of the credit union system would look like at second tier would be closer to consolidate and separate. Mm -hmm. Single functions able to be governed and controlled by credit unions directly who use those services. So I'm wondering what led you uh, in this paper to think that uh, bringing those different functions together would uh, better meet the challenges set out for these design principles because I, I think in the credit union system in the past, and this is a big challenge in any of these, is the past, um, but that the more things have been smushed together, the harder it has been to hold each of those business lines accountable for performance, mm -hmm. both financial and in uh, yeah. member and strategic value. So I think that's an, that's an excellent observation and point. And I would say that one of the reasons as well that um, design principle six then is a way of, of um, 
you have to think about these principles as a, as a blueprint. And I think that that's one reason why design principle six also exists. Um, because there is this understanding that ac you can't actually just sort of think about this as the governance of this central organization and that's it. Because yes, you're right, there's a whole bunch of P there's a whole bunch of problems that can be created in terms of principal agent problems at all levels of forms of op various forms of opportunism, hold being able to hold uh, the different business lines accountable, um, and just the complexity of that kind of organization to be able to operate um, it well. And I think that um, I think about Federated Cooperatives Limited as an example of that. Um, I, there's very few organizations that I know of that operate across more diverse business lines um, with more um, differences between their members in terms of rural and urban, um, what they members want, say, federated to focus on. Um, and I think that uh, there are a number of different ways that, that those kinds of issues can be addressed. Um, and not to think about the sort of the um, annual meeting or even the board as the, prime, uh, the only way that those kinds of issues are resolved. So in terms of uh, design principle six as well, organizing governance activities in multiple layers and thinking about governance as a framework as opposed to just thinking about it as corporate governance at the board level. Um, because I agree with you, I think in that case, if we think about it just there, and we think about just how we get feedback um, from all of the members and, and all across all lines, just at, then it's overwhelming. Um, but I think there's a variety of ways that um, when you actually sort of think about this at as a framework and incorporate it at all levels and in all types of activities in different ways. Um, and also not just think about governance as the formal structure, right? There's also informal norms and ways of cons consulting stakeholders um, and, and having input from them and building consensus um, in other ways and providing that input to the board that don't have to be done in the same sort of st formal structures that we've, come, that we've uh, become accustomed to. Does that answer a bit of the question? So, John, you know I love this paper, <laughs> but I, I do have a question or a suggestion. Maybe it's a question. Um, it strikes me that the challenge with the credit union system right now in, in these tier second tier conversations is that they're nested in a larger policy discussion. And I think, you know, I, in the financial services sector, policy and regulation absolutely sets the terms for all these conversations. And I think that's what's maybe missing here. So you, you, you talked about these common pool resources, for example. Well, deposit insurance is siloed by province, for example. And so no province wants to be exposed to another province. And so then that's going to shape the conversations that happen there. Um, it's the same thing, I think, across the board. Even the branding. I don't know if we have a common pool resource there. So I mean, I think there's a challenge in terms of even thinking in terms of a common pool resource. And then there's a challenge in terms of collaborating across provincial boundaries with different rules in each province. Um, and uh, so I'd just like you to maybe think or address yeah. those, those kind of points, please. So um, you're, of course, the one who's made me think much more in depth about, uh, so thank you, Mark andre for that question, about the policy environment and the structure, you know, the structure of the provinces and, and the regulation of credit unions. Um, and I think that I think that we have to be aware that um, the policy environment and the laws and the, the structure of deposit insurance and all of these kinds of things does actually pose a constraint on the system. Um, but many other systems uh, also have to operate across jurisdictions and figure out ways to, um, to deal, with, uh, deal with some of these differences. And I also think that um, Sometimes we take the policy environment as set, and I think the great example for me is recently in the credit union <laughs> sector, um, the bank banking issue. Um, there was a huge m counter movement to when OSFI came out with that uh, bank banking regulation that actually got the attention of the regulators. And they changed their mind. Maybe not, it, we're not quite sure where it's going to fall, but they actually have backed off from the uh, initial strictness of that. And I think a uh, testament to the initial, the social movements that the, the credit union leaders started, but also to credit, uh, Canadian Credit Union Association for being part of those policy discussions and really creating relationships um, with the regulators. And, and I think, so I think sometimes we think about policy and, and legal structures as set. And, and the investor-owned firms have shaped those structures to benefit them. 
in many ways, right? And in, that's, in many of those ways, that's why credit unions are at a disadvantage uh, in operating in some of these systems. And, and so I, I think that that's actually a common pool resource that can be used to actually start to think about how we might create the structures, the legal structures, the regulatory structures, the policy environments to support a vibrant credit union system and not take it as just given. And I'm not, I'm not underestimating the challenge. <laughs> I, I know because I hear <laughs> stories from you about dealing with, um, with regulators and with uh, the government and governments have lots of things on their mind. Uh, um, but I think the credit union, that's that lobbying activity um, or that it's not even about lobbying, it's about being part of the conversation and educating the regulators and the policymakers about what kinds of things are challenging. Um, there's solutions to be had there, but again, that's hard to have when the credit unions themselves can't overcome their collective action problem to work together, um, to come together and agree on what kinds of things they want to do together. Or if CCUA is a common property resource, uh, under investment in CCUA, for instance, if that's a possible problem. I don't know if that's a problem, but if it, uh, many credit unions might benefit from, um, from the activities of CCUA but not invest in it. So um, that is, I think, my answer to that, but I'm not naive um, about, about the challenges that that poses, and I think um, we have to do far more. In fact, one of Ostrom's, uh, and it's why one of my implications is this issue about governments and regulators, right? But don't see that as set. See that as, as malleable, um, especially if credit unions come together and can, can have strength in uh, numbers uh, when they go to the government with some of these ideas. Uh, you have to, I think, use the mic uh, so that the... Thank you for the course. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. I just have a, perhaps because I, I, I sat there as a student of your course, I have a, maybe a naive question. How much of this, uh, you talked about credit unions, how much of this would apply to federated cooperatives in general? I mean, can, can this be generalized and what would be the dimensions that perhaps they change? Thank you. Yeah, so I think the way we actually uh, have a, a more academic paper that was developed based on our um, research over the years on uh, co-op federations like Federated Cooperatives, like Co-op Atlantic. Um, so I think in that case, uh, it was our framework was developed actually in a totally different sector and we're thinking, struggling through now, applying it to the credit union sector. So I think that in itself shows that there is some generalizability to the framework and the approach. I also have done some work, interesting enough, in, um, in uh, regulation of professions across provincial boundaries. And this is an interesting one that actually has, anal has a, an analog to uh, the credit union system where professions in Canada, many professions, are regulated at the provincial level. In fact, most of them are. And so they have to come together in these national sort of trade associations and work together across different regulatory frameworks. Um, and they struggle um, with almost all of these identical issues. And I think that, I, I haven't done it yet, but I think it, there's even application to other types of federations. Um, and I have some colleagues that I know are applying some of these ideas to nations. Um, so I, I, I don't want to sort of become like how economists become hegemonic and sort of say we've figured out the, <laughs> the framework um, to solve all problems and uh, for all forms of collective action. <laughs> and in fact, Eleanor Ostrom actually came up with many of these design principles first, right? We're just now applying them to other kinds of uh, sectors and industries beyond natural resource systems, uh, human-made um, systems like uh, cooper cooperatives and uh, other types of industries. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. I just have two things. Um, one is um, what makes you think that um, the principles that were developed by Lynn, that she applied to populations of, of 5,000 to 25,000, that they would fit into this larger ship that you look at at the moment. I mean, um, is it really applicable? I mean, that's a, that's there's a huge membership and this is a, a, a large tanker, so to say. And another thing is just a semantical thing. Um, it's the, this idea of the blueprint. Mm -hmm. um, um, 
I'd be careful with the <laughs> blueprint because I know that Lynn hated the term. She really hated yeah. it. She said, stop blueprint thinking. Yeah. So if you yeah. bring her together with <laughs> her principles <laughs> in, in the story, yeah. there's a little... Uh, so that's... that's, that's it, I know exactly what you mean yeah. with that, and I think it's it's formidable. It's just that I would take that out <laughs> of the of, of so that might be more the business s school side of me coming out and wanting to give uh, this idea of. Uh, but I agree. I want to actually uh, avoid this idea that they're best practices, right, or that this is like a necessarily an ideal archetype. So absolutely, I 100% agree with you. Um, yes, and I think in terms of your uh, first question. Um, I think that, I think that I would ask. I mean, I guess it would. Maybe this is begging the question, but uh, I, I haven't been able to find a, a system that where where we where this actually couldn't apply just because it's smaller. So, like I said, we've applied it, um, and it works fairly well to understand some of the successes that Federated Cooperatives has had over the years and potentially some of the challenges that face Co-op Atlantic. There are other explanations um, that I think go into whether or not organizations succeed or fail, mm -hmm. um, but governance is a huge one. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that if we think about governance as important to uh, th for the sustainability of any system interdependent system, whether it's an organization or um, then we have to be able to think about ways of talking about governance as academics that can bring it together because there's so many different ways of talking about governance. Mm. Um, and so maybe it may not be applicable to all of these different kinds of systems, but I think that's an empirical question and I couldn't probably answer it um, right now. But no, it was just a question. Yeah, I think it's a great yeah. question though. Please join me in thanking Dion for <laughs> for um, I think a very very stimulating um, lecture, um, and um, you'll have lots of chance here in a few minutes uh, when we break to ask Dion some questions um, and um, sort of pin her to the wall on, on some other things. Um, we didn't tell Dion this, that, that um, the, the person who asked the last question, Marcus Hanisch, um, actually knew um, uh, Lynn Ostrom quite well, um, has worked on her writings, um, and um, is, is a, a bit of a scholar um, of Ostrom. So uh, we didn't tell Dion that before uh, we, um, uh, we, we invited her to do this. Um, no, I know. Um, uh, b by the way, I also wish to acknowledge um, and just let you know that Marcus Hanisch um, is or was last year's um, McPherson Talks speaker, and it's great to have him back um, here again um, this year.